and this time around we're going to be talking about data exchange. Um, why are we talking about this? What is the big deal? Um, you know, we hear from from countries that they are really keen on and trying and striving, just as we are as a community, to support the continuum of care across sites and borders. This is something we definitely heard hear, heard come up um, in some of our plenary sessions at our December 2020 implementers meeting. Um, how do you make sure? How how can you assure the the continuum of care? How can you provide patients with quality care when they are moving from site to site, even within a country, or even even moving across borders, um, how do you how do you assure that you have complete patient data to provide them with with the, the right care and treatment? Um, and then along with that, we we heard um, that many countries, many implementers are all interested in reducing the multiplicity of systems out there. So all of this kind of comes down to figuring out how we can get data out of OpenMRS. How can we share data? across systems in an easy, consistent, simple way. So what we're going to do during this showcase is take a look at um, a few of our key projects. So we have that are that are working on solutions that will help make data exchange easier. So we're going to look at, at the data, the OpenMRS Dictionary Manager web app. Um, we're going to hear a little bit about a proof of concept around patient level indicator reporting. We're going to hear what our fire squad is doing, um, not only with our fire two module, but also in terms of QA for fire based open HIE workflows. So the three squads that we have um, for you to watch today are the dictionary manager squad, the analytics engine squad, and the PLIR fire squad. Um, and, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, these squads com consist of individuals and people working with, with implementations. So some of the implementers that you see who are actively participating in these squads include MSF, PIH, AMPATH, and um, ITEC DG. And then, like I said earlier, we're also encouraging implementers to showcase the work they're doing in this area. So um, I hope that we'll also hear a couple of talks from, from Jembi about the work that they're doing with DICEY. So let's let's look a little bit about what at what these these squads are working on, right? So the dictionary manager squad is really looking at um, helping people leverage dictionaries that are already in use. So 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 that you don't have to build your dictionary from scratch. You can you can build it once and then you can reuse it across any implementation and share it with other organizations. This squad has been working really closely with um, with OCL. And, um, and we'll hear about what they're doing shortly. Next up, we will have the analytics engine squad and they are really working on getting data out of OpenMRS and improving data use for indicator reporting, which will in turn reduce all of that time that technical teams spend um, trying to get data out of OpenMRS and respond to either routine or ad hoc reporting requests. And all of this and doing the, all of this in a way that will make it easier to drill down to the patient level data. So we'll hear the latest from them. Um, and then we'll hear from the patient level indicator reporting squad, um, which is contributing an OpenMRS application side solution to an integrated approach that that supports patient level indicator reporting using a standards based HIE architectural framework. So this is really exciting work. This is actually going to be the last um, update we see from the PLIR squad because they have met their objectives. Um, and so I really encourage you to, to see what they have to share with you. And then we will hear from our fire squad um, who, is, who is working on tooling that will transform data that can be ready ready and easily shared with other systems. Um, and this is not only um, in, you know, focused on the, the FIRE module, the FIRE 2 module, um, we're also, they're also working on solutions that will exchange those FIRE resources with other systems, including Open Ellis, um, which, which is a lab system, OpenCR for MPI and Happy Fire servers. So we have a number of exciting showcases um, to share with you in the next, Oh, 35, 40 minutes. And let's get started with the dictionary manager um, squad. And I think we have Saruchi who's going to be um, taking, taking this up. 
So Richie, are you there? She is here, but actually, um, just in case we have internet problems, I'm going to go ahead and share the pre-recording. Okay, so are you going to share your screen? Yes. Okay. And uh, please let me know um, if at any point the audio or visual starts lagging. All right. Hello everyone, this is Suruji. Welcome to Dictionary Manager, previously known as OCL for OpenMRS. So, what is Dictionary Manager Squad? It is a bunch of beautiful minds from different organizations working together to solve common problems and paying in concept management. Well, these are the common problems that we are solving. It's designed for non-technical staff who need to manage concepts. And now you can reuse your previous work and no migration and scripts are needed for content. You can view the public work done by other organizations and you can use sources to quickly pull together a dictionary. So what Dictionary Manager is? It is a front-end UI app that leverages the OCL database and API in order to manage concepts more easily for OpenMRS. What do we need to set up in order to use Dictionary Manager? Well, it's quite easy. You can try it out in ready-to-use web app at our demo site. All you need to do is sign up. You must be thinking, what if I'm using a different system? The underlying OCL system itself is not OpenMRS specific and focus is on medical terminology, but not technically limited to it. Concepts managed in Dictionary Manager are updated in OCL itself, which means if you choose to switch away from OpenMRS, the concepts are still available in OCL. Now let's quickly view our roadmap. These are the features which are in our release stage, which includes more reusable option to reuse concept from any sources or dictionary, improve error message, which means there is no more confusing alerts in OCL module, and we have MVP for trusted content flag to differentiate content from the other trusted one and filter option for already added concept while adding concepts from other sources and dictionaries. And these are the features in our designing stage, which includes trusted content flag and customization of curated concept and clear review changes while updating subscription from subscription URL. These are the features which we are considering for future, which are update notification to, up, to update the trusted source content and give alert, business intelligence for concept governance and discussion tool, like chat, messaging flags to communicate concept needs and confusion. To get started, let's join OCL for OpenMRS squad at 1 p.m. UTC every Wednesday. And for expert advice and discussion for creating concept, you can join concept management office hour at 2 p.m. UTC Wednesday or Thursday alternating. Now let's dive right into our demo for our new features. Well, let me view the public sources and see if I can make use of this in my dictionary. But here are a lot of sources and many of them seems to be demo or test one, and some of them are with the same name. So I'm not sure which one is the authentic one, but this option helps me find out. Now I can view that CIL is the trusted one and I can make use of it. Further, while selecting concepts to add in my dictionary from other sources, I need to know if I'm selecting the trusted source or not. And this icon helps me find out. Further, while creating concepts, I need to use the sources in set members and mapping. Here also, I can find out which one is the trusted one. Oh, well, this is a trusted one, whereas these are not. And also, we have a new feature of filter for already added concepts. These are the concepts already in my dictionary test one, and I'm going to add few more. 
Now I have this feature of include added concepts and this will help me filter out. So these are the concepts already added and these are not. Further, I can select more sources and dictionary to add concepts in my dictionary. These are the sources which are public and these are the dictionaries. So I'm going to add a few more from here also. Let me add these two. Well, these are added in my dictionary test one. Well, this is added. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Saruchi. It's it's really exciting to see how much faster it is to pull dictionaries together. I know not too long ago we had some of our folks uh, from Ori putting together dictionary content, and and they needed to be able to pull in uh, concepts they'd already added into a dictionary and be able to reuse those across additional dictionaries. And these features make all that possible. So th thanks so much to the squad for your work. Yeah, thank you for the great presentation. And um, if anybody is interested in learning more about this, the Dictionary Manager Squad or wants to join in, um, you can learn more on their wiki page or you can connect with them via Slack or during their weekly call on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. UTC. And of course, um, your may, you know, if for more specific questions, contact Grace or Saruchi. Um, we're going to hear next up from the analytics engine squad, um, Bashir. Are you ready to take it away? Uh, yes. Hi. So let me just uh, share my presentation. Actually, the, um, can you see the slides? We can see yeah. your slides. Okay, cool. So these slides are actually included in, in the series of uh, slides that uh, Jen was showing. So hopefully it's accessible to everyone. So I, I'm going to quickly go over what we have done uh, more uh, recently uh, for in the analytics engine. I will cover uh, an overview of it very quickly of, uh, of you know, the background and also what we have done recently. Um, but I, I should acknowledge that you know this is a work with uh, uh, several people that are actually actively contributing to in the analytics engine. In particular, Alan from Ampad, who is actually co-leading their work with me. And you know some of the designs that you see today actually it's a joint work with uh, with him. Um, and also this is a link to our GitHub repository in case that anyone wants to look at the code and the details. So I will go very quickly through the background uh, because we have talked about this a few times. So basically at the pipeline stage, we have uh, batch and streaming pipelines, which are basically to take data from OpenMRS as fire resources. So we try to actually use the fire module as much as we can. Uh, and then basically they are exported into a data warehouse, uh, which is then used for um, you know, further down queries. So the data warehouse is basically a collection of Parquet files at this point, but you know, we can actually support other data warehouses as well. Um, and so right today I focus more on uh, how to calculate you know, program metrics like PEPFAR indicators, for example, or do interactive queries, but obviously the data warehouse can be used for other things as well. And there is also another use case, which I don't talk about at all, but it, you know, these pipelines are used for that as well, which is basically to sync to uh, 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 an external uh, fire server. Um, uh, like a shared health record. And I think the PLIR team maybe covered this a little bit because they use these pipelines as well. Okay, but more recently what we have done, uh, especially over the last quarter, so we had some fires that we had to put out at the beginning of the uh, uh, quarter for the pipelines. Uh, I'm not going to cover those here. There are too much technical uh, details, but one thing that you know we have changed is the query library API. Uh, that we have designed a new uh, query library. So one of the pain points that we heard uh, loud and clear from uh, several people 
was the complexity of both fire uh, uh, structures uh, for analytics queries and also Spark, which is the underlying engine that we use to do distributed uh, data processing. I have to emphasize that you know our focus is a lot about a uh, big, big amount of data. So if you have a small amount of data, maybe these tools are not actually the best tools. But when you have um, significant, you know, big databases that, you know, it's it's hard to actually process on a single machine and you need to do distributed data processing, that's where the tools that we are developing uh, might be handy. So we we with the new query API, we have tried to hide the, the details of both fire structures and also the underlying uh, distributed query engine. So for example, from the very beginning, we had also this idea to push data to BigQuery, for example, which is uh, Google's data warehouse solution. And with the, with the new query API, this detail is completely hidden from the user. So whether the underlying data are Parquet files on the disk or whether they are in BigQuery uh, should be hidden from the user. We also hide the fire structure details. So basically what the, the user of the query library, they just they specify a list of codes that they are interested in, some date constraints and some value constraints. And in return, they just get a simple flat view, uh, which is normal Pandas data frame. So our assumption here is that, you know, most of our users are like data scientists or people who can actually work with uh, Pandas data frames. So for interactive queries, it should be easy for them to use uh, Pandas data frame. And I don't talk too much about the current schema that we have for this flat view, which is because it is under heavy development. So from week to week, we change that based on the uh, needs that we have. Alan is uh, hard at work implementing more and more uh, PEPFAR indicators. And then, you know, based on those needs, we may change this uh, schema but this is a sample that you can see it's just like a um uh, a pandas data frame that they have taken from a jupyter notebook that i use for testing so basically we have some patient information and then in each row we have some aggregate values for for a code for a, for an observation code like you know how many how many observations uh, in in the query period was there? What are the minimum value, maximum values, and the dates for those minimum and maximum, and so on. So let me actually, yeah, I just want to emphasize again here that um, for for the user, for a general user of the query library, the idea is that no Fire or a Spark knowledge should be required. So basically, they should be able to use our tools without knowing at all about Fire or Spark. Obviously, you know, we have chosen Fire because it's a standard and we can actually work beyond just OpenMRS. So it's actually uh, a, a query, uh, uh, the analytics engine can be used for, hopefully at some point for any Fire server, not just OpenMRS. So that's the nice thing about working with the standard. And obviously Spark is also a standard, um, you know, distributed environment. But the user of the API, uh, query API, doesn't need to know these kind of uh, details. So I'll go quickly over a simple example, uh, which is, you know, I have put the Jupyter Notebook link here. This is from the same GitHub repo. People can look at, look at it and um, actually play with it if they, uh, uh, in their uh, own environment. So this is how, uh, we create a patient uh, query object, which is the main object to uh, query the, uh, the data. Uh, so in this case, we are specifying a base di uh, directory for the Parquet files. And we say that, you know, okay, create a, um, a patient uh, um, query object that uses a Spark and the files are here and I want to work in this code system. So this is the only place that people need to say something about the Spark or BigQuery or something else. So if their data is in BigQuery, for example, they just say my runner is, is BigQuery. And then instead of providing a base directory, they provide a, a data set for BigQuery. Or in future, we may even support a basic fire server as well. So people don't even need to export their data to uh, through the pipelines to be able to use this. Then for um, 
the, the second step is basically to specify what uh, the user is looking for. And here is just one example. These uh, codes are you know, fake codes from the demo data because that's all I have. But uh, for example, when Alan runs on AMPAD data, he uses you know real codes for what uh, we are looking for, but let's say let's say this code is for viral load, for example, this uh, the first one, and then I can say um, I am looking for viral load in this time frame, and I am looking for ARV plan for this time frame, and you and we can also say that you know also include all other codes as well uh, in this time frame. And you know there are other, other features as well that I haven't shown here. You can specify the values that you're interested in and so on. The idea here is that I may want some a longer range for some codes, and then I, I may need uh, like a, let's, let's say last month or last quarter for all other codes basically. So when I specify these requirements, I create, I, I create an aggregate uh, Pandas data frame from my query, uh, patient query object. So that's basically the, the highlighted part is, is, is basically doing that. So what it does under the hood, it reads all par parquet files and then does the flattening and calculate the aggregates. And next, um, because this is a, a normal pandas data frame, I can do all the nice things that I am used to do with my pandas data frame. Here, I am just taking uh, a, one specific code, and I'm looking for those cases that the, they have at least two um, two observations, so that you know minimum date and maximum date are different. And then I am doing a projection on the columns that I am interested in. So that's what I get. And finally. Um, the, main, the, 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 the thing that you know we are building on top of this is, that, is the indicator uh, library, which is basically implementation of the PEPFAR uh, uh, indicators, but that's pure uh, Pandas uh, operations. So there is, um, there is no uh, Spark uh, operations in, in that library. Uh, so I, I think I can finish with that. And sorry that you know, I, I went over time a little bit. Yeah, and here, you know, there are some of the contributors to, to the work. There are other people who are not included here as well. Thank you. Thanks, Bashir. And yeah, as with the Dictionary Manager Squad, you can find out more on the Analytics Engine Squad wiki page um, or connect with them via Slack or join their weekly meetings Thursdays at 2 p.m. UTC. So moving right along, um, next up we have Cliff, who will share um, what's happening with the PLIR squad. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Basically, uh, the player squad um, is about uh, fetching uh, patient level data from um, OpenMRS to a shared, uh, uh, to a happy fire server through uh, and open him so through uh, open him. So basically, that's what uh, it's all about. And then doing uh, indicator uh, calculations. So uh, some of the milestones and uh, achievements that we've had, uh, we've been able to develop um, um, TX PVLS and TX call indicators for as as part of the POC. And then we also build the uh, the capacity for reading uh, fire measure resources for the two ind indicators. And then uh, we also integrated um, the automation testing into uh, the HIE automation framework for uh, player. And then uh, being able to build uh, a CI pipeline uh, using GitHub actions for the, for the automation testing. And then uh, we also have a Dockerize setup uh, ready for this uh, proof of concept. Yeah, uh, next slide. So, oh, sorry. Uh, to the next one, then we shall come back to this one. Just for the sake of time, yeah. So these are the wiki pages uh, containing all the details, uh, the technical bit of it. Yes, and then I uh, also have links to the demo videos. Uh, the first one is covering TXPVLS, and the second one is covering TXCAL. Uh, TXPVLS is uh, mainly a percentage of our patients with a suppressed viral load. And then uh, TXCAL is a uh, uh, patients who are currently on ART, that is uh, receiving HIV treatment. And then lastly, we have um, the GitHub link to the Dockerize setup. Uh, you can you can back up 
the previous slide. So, yes, yeah, so uh, we've, well, we came up with a, a, a presentation demo for the TXPGLS. And then uh, for the sake of time, we shall, uh, we shall leave out the automation testing bit of it. So thank you. So we can play it. All right, just a second. Let me make sure that I have the... the sound being shared. Okay. Here we Hello everyone, I'm Moses, and I'm demonstrating about the PLAR pipeline, which contributes to an integrated approach that supports patient-level reporting using a standards-based HIA architecture framework. And this is a proof of concept, which supports the calculation of the TXPVLS indicator, which indicator represents the percentage of ad patients with a suppressed viral load that is results less than a thousand copies. This is my open MRS instance, which is the data source. This is my open him instance, which is going to act as the middleware component to track all the requests and transactions. And this is my happy fire server, which is a shared health record to store all the patient level data in fire format. And this is a simple widget to visualize the major report from Happy Fire. I'm also running a Debezium Spring pipeline, which will listen to all data that is added into OpenMRS and push it to Happy Fire through OpenHIM. Trying to query Happy Fire. So, make sure I have no any patient. At the moment, I don't have any data in my shared health record, so I, I don't have any result for the indicator. I'm going to add a patient in OpenMRS. And I'll skip the other values, not relevant for this part. After my patient is added in OpenMRS, the pipeline will listen to that change and export that data to the shared health record through OpenHIM. I can see OpenHIM tracks the transaction and I'll query my Happy Fire server to check whether my patient has been persisted. I can see there is a patient record. Now I'll proceed to my widget and query the indicator. At the moment, I still have no result for the indicator because the patient that has been persisted does not have any viral load data. So I'll go back to OpenMRS and capture an observation value for the patient, a very load value. I'll give it I'll give him a, a suppressed value which is less than a thousand. So my observation still will be exported by my my analytics pipeline. So on querying the results again, I can see that I at least I have some values in my indicator. 
I'm also going to try to add another patient and give them an observation value that is above 1,000. I'll give the patient a viral load above 1,000. And I go back to my widget to query updated results. So I can see now my results are updated. So I have two patients. One has a suppressed value and the other doesn't have, so my major score is 50%. And the happy, uh, our happy fire supports collect data operation, which generates the, all the relevant data set for the TXPVLs indicator. So I can also query it directly to get all the data that is relevant for the, for the indicator. So the widget can export uh, the JSON data for, for the major report. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks, Cliff. And um, um, I'm just going to move on to uh, before we move on to the fire squad. Um, and I'm giving you a sneak preview. Um, I just want to highlight the fact that you know this work really drew from both the what the analytics engine squad was working on and what the fire squad was working on. And I also do actually want to um, say a special thank you to Digital Square for their support for this work. Um, Moses and Cliff are two of our first fellows, and Digital Square's um, funding actually helped us support support them in this effort. So. Um, thank you, Cliff. Thank you, Moses. And thank you, Digital Square. Um, moving on, our next showcase is from the Fire Squad. And I think, actually, Moses, I'm turning it over to you. Uh, thanks, Jen. Can I share my screen? Go for it. Where you go? Can, can everyone see my screen? I can see Hello. your screen. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so um, I'm just going to take us through uh, the first squad of this. And as we've seen, actually, uh, I mean, uh, right from the micro front end uh, presentation, they've been talking about the first squad. Uh, so I'm just going to, I mean, some of the things I'm going to present have been already tackled on. Um, so uh, just in brief to make this quick, basically what we are solving, uh, problems we are solving, interoperability between systems, and uh, then providing transformation of open source data into a common exchange format with other systems. And also, we are basically building a tool to support data exchange with other systems like uh, lab information systems, an example, Open Ellis. Uh, it supports fire. Then master patient index, uh, like Open CR. And then share health records, like a happy fire server, uh, something like that has been presented by the PLRS card. And then um, also support uh, data exchange uh, support um, a re reporting, like uh, actually what, what is being done in the fire analytics engine. Uh, they basically kind of like, I extract fire data from open minds and then uh, perform indicator calculations on it. And then uh, 
we also kind of like trying to support OpenMRS 3.0 microphones NZUI. Uh, it primarily uses a, a, a Fire API uh, for, for the new eye. Uh, so a few things we are trying to work on or work in progress is uh, we kind of like trying to work integrating our uh, Uh, to, to, we are trying to basically uh, be able to make OpenMRS integrate with other custom applications that support Fire using uh, uh, the smart framework. That is in uh, also uh, integrating it with Kick Clock or to authentication server. Um, given that OpenMRS is a key OpenHI a component, so it's crucial for it to be able to integrate with other systems. And a part of the work we are doing is to support Fire-based OpenHIE workflows. Uh, that is to client registries, as I mentioned earlier, like OpenCR. And, um, and then also uh, support export data to shared health records and also to lab information, lab orders to, uh, like sending lab orders and receiving results from uh, lab information systems like OpenELIS. And uh, we are also trying to part of the part of what the squad is doing to help easily integrate uh, OpenMRS in the inside OpenHI in our project. This is a project that uh, tries to make it easy for you to set up um, uh, um, an OpenHI architecture project. So part of what we're doing is to support that, basically using a firewall workflow. working on is actually uh, development of mature implementation guides for defining specifications. So that's part of the work we're doing. And we're also working on um, on a test-focused IG, uh, whereby we can we can easily test the integration between the dis different systems using a testable IG. In, in, in this approach, uh, we're basically going to leverage the fire Fire script resources to kind of like uh, define the test scripts, and uh, we're working on an approach how we can be able to run those and uh, test the workflow specifications between the uh, the different systems. And uh, of course, in this work, we are also kind of like collaborating with uh, two A teams, OpenHIE community and OpenELIS communities to see that we actually get this uh, to to livelihood, to, to get it working. Uh, some of the other milestones and achievements we've achieved as the Fire Squad, we released the Fire 2, uh, sorry, version 1.21 that supports immunizations, encounters, viz, and some other few fixes and bugs. Um, yes, some of the things we've also achieved is uh, integration to the an, an open HI is set up. Actually, I think I, I would say even the, I, I can also include the PLA work uh, into this. I mean, uh, as part, part of what we've achieved in open HI integration. And then yeah, so we've also collaborated with the uh, PLIR and Fire squad. Uh, I mean, those, those, those are part of the projects and uh, tools that have been uh, uh, using the Fire API and uh, using Fire Data. And so, uh, part of the upcoming features is also we need to we are working to working on to support uh, patch operations in uh, the Fire Two module. That is, you can uh, be able to easily update resources without kind of like sending the entire resource. I mean, you simply update uh, a given portion of the resource without sending the entire resource. So th th that was just a brief squad update on what we are kind of like uh, trying to work on. And um, yeah, we're seeking implementers interested in leveraging Fire to solve integration problems. Pro probably could get feedback from implementers. And uh, we also need more devs. And uh, thanks to our, to the Fire team, uh, our tech leads, Ian Bacher and Christina White, and then the other members, including Bit from Ampath, Pieter from UASH, myself, Cliff, 
Yep, and the uh, rest of the members that have done great work to 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 get this squad moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. And once again, anybody is welcome to connect with the fire squad or join them either on Slack or during their weekly call Tuesdays at 3 p.m. UTC. All and any are welcome. Um, we're now going to move into our implementer showcase section of this um, data exchange showcase. And I'd like to invite Ryan from Jemby to, um, to share with us, he, you're going to do a presentation or lightning talk on um, Dicey requirements and Dicey architecture, I believe. So if you're ready to go, I can hand the controls over to you. Thanks very much. Hi everybody, this is Ryan here from Jemby. Um, let me just get my screen shared and then we can kick it off in one second. All right, so I hope that's uh, displaying correctly. Um, great, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the Dicey architecture work that uh, Jemby has been involved with. Um, this is basically to try a program through um, that sort of led by CDC through some PEPFAR funding um, and the technical assistance program, sorry, platform. Uh, to try to create a recommended architecture and a reference implementation for doing data analytics um, in, in the health domain. So uh, it's not going to be so much of a, a showcase today, it's more showcasing the, the architecture and the way that we're thinking so far, although we do have some prototypes of this stuff in action um, as well. I uh, might be able to share some, some links to, to some of those. Um, but just to start, uh, what is DICI? So that stands for the, the Data Integration Systems and Implementation. Um, so it's a program through PEPFAR that aims to provide practical guidance or recommendations for integrating health data from different um, sources. Um, initially, this is going to be focused on um, HIV case-based surveillance um, with an eye to sort of be expanded into any um, health domain. Uh, and that the vision is really to provide this guidance on how um, countries might want to do this, this sorts of thing um, in terms of data sharing. So this could be from um, not just OpenMRS, but many other um, health systems that might be on the ground um, in a particular uh, country. Okay, so I'm going to divide the, the presentation into two um, major sections. The first is talking about the conceptual architecture, um, and the next will be more of a logical architecture with some actual um, uh, decisions on systems. Okay, so the conceptual architecture, this is going to describe the sort of the overall um, architecture of what we're trying to do, agn agnostic of any specific technology, sort of just like a, um, a, a blueprint of uh, what we're trying to accomplish um, and to provide a sort of a solid base for the requirements and the further logical architectures that actually describe what, um, what actual systems and components we might be using. So it's quite a, uh, it's probably a small diagram. So I'm going to tackle it in two slides. Uh, so we'll look at the bottom part um, first. So basically, this is sort of concentrated around HIV case-based surveillance. So at the very bottom, we have a list of point of service applications. This could be EMRs, lab systems, pharmacies, um, civil registration systems. OpenMRS, for example, would be um, part of those, those systems. Um, and they all be generating events uh, for uh, HIV events. So like first HIV positive, linkage to care, first CD4 count, et cetera. Um, the idea is to try to capture those and get them sent up to, uh, uh, to centralize them um, in a central data repository. Um, or you could also think of that as a shared health record and, and then report it off of. So those events um, we need to travel up to that that's, uh, central data repository. We do that through an interoperability layer um, and then some orchestration steps um, that happen uh, in between that. We also define that there's probably going to be or well, we want there to be a, a simple standards-based exchange format, um, which just is a, like a minimum way for systems to get involved and, and share standardized data and a more complete format, which um, will share full structures with re relationships um, that uh, represents that data. 
we use some orchestration services to map the simple formats to the more advanced formats. This is just to cater for systems that um, maybe are of lower complexity or um, have less support for fire and those that have more uh, well, for a, a standards based format and those that have more advanced support for a standards based format. Um, and then we have some mapping uh, the services that, um, that happens to convert from one to the other. We also have an orchestration step. Um, that's the job of that is before the data actually ends up in a central data repository, we have to always ensure that there's a patient identity attached to that, um, that data. So this, these lines you'll see in the next slide will go up to a master patient index. So we orchestrate the message, ensure that the, there's an identity created for that, um, that uh, clinical data um, before it ever lands in the, the central data repository. And this is to do things like deduplication and um, matching and linking of, of patients, um, which my colleague Laura will talk to next as well, um, or some of the work we're doing there. So from there, um, the data ends up in a central data repository. And this is the sort of um, interesting part where it gets extracted and made available for reporting. So we just uh, describe, um, well, at least conceptually, a streaming data pipeline that takes the data as it arrives in the central data repository and processes through um, this data pipeline doing things like um, the identification, masking of particular um, information, and most importantly, transformations of the data, flattening of the data, joining um, the data together in, into a, a structure that makes more sense for reporting off of uh, before it lands in a, a data, a data mart. Uh, which is a, another store that we then use for reporting off of. This is done for uh, to optimize um, the way the reports are generated so it can be more efficient than uh, doing it off your transactional database. Uh, and then a visualization tool to work off of that. Okay, so enough of the conceptual. Let's jump into what we're looking at at the moment. So this will be the logical um, architecture. This is work in progress. This is the current approach we're looking at. Um, there may be a few others. I'm actually very interested to see what the um, analytics engine team is, is doing as well. Um, I think our, the architecture conceptually is quite similar. So, um, but logically we're using different technologies. So it's interesting to catch up there. Um, <clears throat> so one of the first things that we wanted to, to nail down in the conceptual, moving from conceptual to logical is the data format. So obviously fire makes the most sense here. We also want to use happy fire as the central data um, repository or shared health record. Um, the way we're using FHIR, I'll go through this only briefly, is basically to take a minimum data set and try to get that converted into a FHIR implementation guide. An implementation guide might contain um, the structures of the different resources that we might be using and the structure and also some questionnaire response resources, um, which will be, it's basically like a simpler way to send data in that's more like sending in a form rather than a, a group of resources. That will be our simple format, whereas the fire, the bundle of all the other fire resources and references between them are going to be the more complete format that I spoke about before. And that's then fed into the, the development pipeline for the point of service systems, as well as the, the CDR and the data pipeline uh, development and uh, report development uh, teams. Next, for actually getting the data out of the, the EMRs or from OpenMRS and uh, into, the, uh, into Happy Fire. Um, well, here we're going to be using the open HIM and mediators for that, um, for transaction mediation. So we have, for example, the fire uh, questionnaire responses going up through the open HIM, um, being converted uh, into a fire bundle using an SDC extract operation. So this is a, a standard way in um, the fire SDC uh, implementation guide to, to convert questionnaire responses into a full full blown fire bundle but I won't go into the details of that today. Um, and then once it's in the file bundle formats, um, that's when we can, we have it sort of have it in its canonical form and can then be orchestrated. Uh, so we then do make sure that the identity exists before that bundle, that full bundle of clinical data is stored into Happy Fire. So then you sort of end up with this longitudinal record for patients within Happy Fire um, for other systems to consume or for the, the data pipeline to consume. Um, and within what we're doing in DICE, OpenRest is actually going to be used as the reference EMR system um, through the, the, um, the ORI 
a system that you might have uh, heard of uh, that's being developed. All right, so the, the interesting part, I think, um, is the data pipeline. So for this, we're using the Elastic Stack. Um, the choice of, the, of using the Elastic Stack was um, one ease of use um, for the end user. So once data is available um, in Elasticsearch, it can be easily queried by a variety of tools, in, including Kibana um, for doing live dashboards and data exploration without requiring much coding knowledge. Um, it, the Elastic Stack consists of a few different tools. So we're using here Logstash in the middle for doing actual data transformations. Uh, Elasticsearch as the data, um, the data mart really, where the data lands. We can use that to do querying and uh, querying for reports and um, storing the actual flattened structured data. Um, and Kibana, like I said, for live dashboards and data exploration. Um, and we also have an added tool onto that for called JS reports, which is good for doing pixel perfect PDF report generation. So um, that was something that's sort of missing in Kibana. So if you want to do PDF tabular reports, um, that's not so easy in, in Kibana, but JS report fills that gap and allows us to, to do that. So I'll try to go through how this works in detail very quickly. Um, so we have Happy Fire on the far left. We have a fire extractor service, which basically queries Happy Fire using the history endpoint. So every, it asks for every resource since it last asked um, and stores that timestamp and pushes those um, into the pipeline. Um, that could be anything from every 10 seconds to every half hour, or whatever you need. So it's sort of um, near real time streaming. Um, then once the data uh, gets into um, the pipeline, that, that's Logstash, it goes through a few different transformation steps. So we take the big fire bundle that the history operation returns, breaks those down into individual fire resources, um, then send those to different pipelines depending on the resource type. And in each of those pipelines for the resource type, we, um, we try to flatten out the structure, flatten out the, the data structures, pull out the elements if you want, uh, enrich uh, the resource with whatever else we need. Um, and then that will then go to Elasticsearch. So we store two things in Elasticsearch. One is the raw resource. So as it was received from Happy Fire. So if we ever need to do reprocessing, um, we can just push that back through the pipeline. And also then the actual reporting index. So the reporting index, we try to keep everything uh, all, all in one sort of document. So multiple resources will be joined together on particular properties to create sort of one flattened um, document that represents a, a, a patient. Uh, and this is done for um, efficiency. Elasticsearch doesn't really do joins on data. Um, it's more efficient to do the join up front as you're ingesting the data. Um, and then the queries are much simpler um, and much more efficient. So that's what we do. Each resource type gets, does a partial update on that index and puts its uh, data into a particular a section on that, on that index that gets filled out as we receive more resource types for that, uh, for a particular patient. Um, so yeah, everything ends up flowing into Elasticsearch into one flattened index that we then um, report so far. Um, and that's, the, uh, that's what I have for today. That's what we're considering at, um, at the moment. We have some prototypes of this working quite well um, and some very complex queries um, going through it and we've been quite happy um, with the results. So I'll leave it there. Um, please ask any questions in the chat if you, uh, I'll try to answer as many as I can. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. I, I had a feeling that your presentation and Laura's, which is coming up next, would fit in um, right alongside with, with, the, with the data exchange theme, and you proved me right. Um, so I, I want to just keep moving ahead, and if you have questions for Ryan, please put it in the chat. And um, I'd like to turn it over to our next presenter, um, Laura, who's going to talk, I believe, about um, patient matching and linking strengthen strengthening. Thank you, Jim. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, great. So I'm going to speak about patient matching. 
And this will be in the context of research and implementation of patient matching for different scenarios. So I'm not going to talk about uh, right now how something like OpenCR or Sans API can be used or other tools. And uh, it's going to be more focused on what is the research that anyone has to do with their data to be able to have a patient matching strategy that, that has good quality so that it creates good quality matching. So typically in when we're doing patient matching, uh, there's this kind of patient identifiers at play. So there's um, these different types. So there's so system IDs, which are generated uh, usually uniquely by different source systems. And uh, one example is uh, open MRS patient identifier. Then there's the demographic identifiers that refer to person characteristics. And then there's a uh, person unique identifiers, which can be used for identifying a, a patient uniquely across different source systems. So the, an example is national ID or phone number. Um, so these source systems may capture these identifiers, all of them or some of them, and they may also capture them in different ways. So different date formats, different validation applied, uh, value sets for the coded values, different mandatory statuses. And also they may capture them with errors. So some kind of common errors can be typing errors, different phonetic interpretations, wrong use of special characters, missing values. So these are the kind of things that make patient matching really difficult at times. On top of that, the person unique identifiers may not be available uh, for all the source systems or not for, not for all the regions in a country. So, so these are the, what causes uh, the difficulty in patient matching. So each source system will capture all this data when, when they register a patient or they update their details and they send this information to a centralized database. This is a generic patient matching scenario. So the aim of patient matching is to process all the data st stored in this database to identify which records belong to the same person. And here we can see a generic uh, patient matching process. So we have this database with all the data, then we can do pre-processing. So in this pre-processing stage, we clean potential errors that, are, that we identify in the data and we can standardize the different ways that the data has been captured from the different source systems so that later on those identifiers can be compared. Then we do blocking, and this is the process of identifying the pairs of records that are likely to match and discarding others. This is to reduce the total number of pairs to compare due to processing power limitations. With the remaining pairs after doing blocking, we do comparison. And here is where we can de decide to use different approaches. So for example, we can use a deterministic approach where we have a hand-coded rules that are predefined to, to define which records match and which don't. Um, and then probabilistic approaches have also been developed to do this. And they uh, assess the discriminatory power of each identifier and also the likelihood that two records are a true match based on whether they agree or disagree on the whole set of identifiers. So in scenarios where unique person identifiers are unreliable or data in general has poor quality, probabilistic methods consistently tend to outperform deterministic methods. So after doing this comparison, matching scores are get calculated for each pair. And a previously defined threshold is used to classify the pairs as non-matches, matches, or potential matches. Then evaluation here is an important step that allows us to measure the accuracy of the matching and determine, for example, the, the optimal threshold that we will use for the classification. Then for the pot potential matches, 
critical review can be done. Uh, this is where a user can manually determine if the potential match is a match or is a non-match, or if there's not enough information, it just remains a potential match. So currently, GEMBI has is doing research on all of these uh, patient matching options and tools. And as part of this, we developed some, some tools that we want to make available as Jupyter Notebooks to, to be able to decide on the best decisions on, on patient matching for any, any context. So one is a generated data set. Um, so where you can choose how many records to generate, you can corrupt the records and generate duplicates at frequency distribution for names, cities, etc. Another tool is uh, one to test different blocking strategies. So you can uh, choose which fields to compare and which algorithms to use and visualize results to make decisions. Then test probabilistic comparison approaches. So for this, we use Splink and Fastlink as the tools. And this is, these are based on the Felegi Center algorithm. And one uh, important characteristic of the tool Splink is that you, it can be used in a multi-server architecture. So it's in a cluster server architecture. So on top of all of this, of course, this, there will be a lot of documentation on to help decide, make the right decisions and assess the, the performance of the, of the matching. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I know that we went a little bit over time, but I think all of these presentations, all of these showcases and, and demos um, are just fantastic to watch and, and great to learn um, how, how different groups are actually approaching very similar problems. Um, and hopefully it looks like from the chat, there are some, some potential conversations to have moving forward. Um, so let's, let's make sure that everybody can, can connect. Um, if you need any help connecting with any groups, um, let, let myself know or Christine know, um, and we can, we can hook you up with the right, right people. Um, 